Remember Live Aid in 1985, that symbol of concern and generosity? Did you know that during that year, the hungriest countries in Africa gave twice as much money to us in the developed world as we gave to them? There was another famine last year. Perhaps you were one of those who took part in Red Nose Day. Did you know that before that day was over, the equivalent of all the money that Comic Relief had raised in Britain, about 12 million pounds, had come back to the rich countries? For every day, this amount is given by the poorest to the rich as interest payments on loans that most of them never asked for or knew existed. In other words, contrary to a myth long popular in the West, it's been the poor of the world who finance the rich, not the other way round. And this film sets out to explain why. It's also a film about war. A war you don't see on your television screens for it's seldom news. It's been described as a silent war. Instead of soldiers dying, there are children dying. More than half a million in one year, according to the United Nations. That's more than twice the number of dead in the Gulf War. Instead of the bombing of bridges, there's the tearing down of forests and other natural resources, the bulldozing of farmland and the running down of schools and hospitals. In many ways, it's like a colonial war. The difference is that these days, people and the resources are controlled not by viceroys and occupying armies, but by other more sophisticated means of which the principal weapon is debt. There are no bullets, but it's a war in which people are dying. War and debt are exactly the same thing, except for one point, which is that nobody needs to occupy territory today. Well, in the 1980s, the World Bank and IMF and the US government and the British government would say to developing countries, you cut government spending, you increase exports, you privatize, or you won't get new loans. Belt tightening is what it's called. What you do is tighten those notches that are easiest to pull. Those notches that affect children, that affect poor people, that affect people who have no power in a political system. Part of the design of structural adjustment programs, that's what these policies are called, is to drive down real wages. The 1980s have been a lost decade for development. The brunt has been borne by the most vulnerable groups, children or mothers uh, with young children. To understand the debt question, one has to understand first that what is taking place today is the greatest transfer of public wealth to private hands in the history of this earth. The process of coercing most of humanity into debt as a means of controlling their resources, their labor and their governments began almost half a century ago. It was not called colonialism. That was a term made defunct by World War II. There were new hopeful euphemisms. Indeed, this was the beginning of what President Bush now calls the New World Order. At Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, delegates from 44 allied and associate countries arrived for the opening of the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. Invited by President Roosevelt, they will work in the seclusion of this White Mountains resort. Along with the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank was set up at the Bretton Woods Conference in America in 1944. The bank's aim was to finance the reconstruction of Europe, then to develop the Third World. It was decided the headquarters would be in Washington, and the president would come from the country with the largest shareholding, and of course the United States is the largest shareholder. The World Bank operates under great secrecy and limited accountability. Every World Bank official is granted immunity from legal action anywhere in the world. Summing up the importance of Bretton Woods, Mr. Vincent says, Ours is a mission of peace designed to establish the economic foundations of peace 
on the bedrock of genuine international cooperation. What this idealism really meant was spelt out in the charter they were signing to promote private foreign investment by means of guarantees or loans made by private investors. The World Bank has always been deceptive about its role in the international economy. It attempts to portray itself as an institution looking out for the interest of not only poor countries, but for poor people within those countries. That has never been the case. They, the bank is, is pushing the interest or promoting the interest of countries in the first world and for an elite sector um, in the third world. That was true in the 1970s. It is particularly true in the 1980s. What became known as the debt crisis got underway in the early 1980s. However, it was a minor crisis for the banks compared with the catastrophe facing the peoples of poor countries. The world's oldest human rights organization, the Anti-Slavery Society, has declared debt a contemporary form of slavery. Nowhere is this more vividly demonstrated than here in the Philippines, where 44% of the national budget is given to paying interest charges to foreign banks, compared with just 3% for health services. Moreover, billions of dollars continue to leave this country just to meet the interest on money borrowed by the dictator Ferdinand Marcos in deals that were often secret and fraudulent. There is perhaps no greater example of the burden of debt than one notorious project in the Philippines. It sits on Bataan Peninsula and is potentially as dangerous as Chernobyl. Built less than 60 miles from the city of Manila on three earthquake faults near two live volcanoes, one of which recently erupted, this is the Bataan nuclear power station. In the Philippines, it's known as the big scam. The scam almost certainly began here, at the Wack Wack Golf Club in Manila, where Ferdinand Marcos used to play with his cousin and chief crony, Herminio Decini. In 1974, the American company General Electric applied to build the Bataan nuclear power station, but Decini urged his pal Marcos to accept the highest bidder, the Westinghouse Company. Moreover, the deal would be underwritten by the American government through the Export-Import Bank and a clutch of private American banks. Everybody would make a buck, except the Filipino people. By 1977, President Carter had stopped the building of nuclear power plants because of their inefficiency and faulty design. But he did nothing to stop the same plants being built in third world countries like the Philippines. Moreover, the State Department, which had to approve Westinghouse's export license, knew the Bataan power station was to be built in an earthquake zone, but still it was encouraged to go ahead. To make the story even more uh, dubious, the U.S. government enters in. William Casey, later the director of the CIA, then head of the Export-Import Bank, an agency which helps U.S. businesses overseas by providing loans and loan guarantees. Casey goes to Manila. Casey comes back recommends that the U.S. government, through this Export-Import Bank, give an initial loan. That opens the gate for all these other banks to come in and give loans, and they start building. Westinghouse at this time does the usual thing. You have delays, you have problems. The price goes up and up and up, first to 1.1 billion, finally to 2.2 billion. Some estimate that the final cost of the Philippines will be 2.6 billion dollars. So, you have a $2.6 billion fiasco that will never produce one watt of electricity, which now the Filipino people have to repay. When Marcos was overthrown in 1986, President Aquino declared the Bataan power station unsafe, and it was closed forever. At the same time, her government began legal action in the United States against Westinghouse. Last year, the American judge found ample evidence of bribery. On the day before the case was due to be heard in March, it was settled out of court. Westinghouse agreed to pay the Philippines $100 million. But remarkably, the Aquino government agreed to give Westinghouse $400 million just to make the power station work, regardless of its position in an earthquake zone. 
And this $400 million will be borrowed from the same American Export-Import Bank and will have to be repaid by the Filipino people, most of whom live in poverty. The World Bank and IMF that pride themselves in being institutions that are helping deal with the debt crisis were being used by a third world president actually for his own internal economic gain in that it was allowing him to continue to service commercial bank debts without getting into trouble, continue to get new loans in, from which again he would take whatever, 1% or 1.5%, and continue to, to enrich himself. When Cory Aquino was swept to power, she described the Philippines as a land of broken promises. Her promise to the Filipino people was that they would be the beneficiaries of their civilized uprising against Marcos. I will vigorously renegotiate, she said, the terms of our foreign debt. But in the end, she gave priority to paying off the banks. Poverty now stands at 70% of the population, a rise of more than 10% since she came to power. A Big Mac is not for the poor. As the debt is paid back at a rate of more than $6 million a day, the rich, like the elites in all debtor nations, increasingly rely on private armies to protect their shopping malls, their homes and their interests. According to Amnesty International, political killings carried out by the government and government-backed forces in violation of the law have become the most serious human rights problem in the Philippines. This is a country abundant in food, but food does not pay back the debt or encourage foreign investors, and so agriculture and a whole way of life is being structurally adjusted. This is the Calabazon super project, turning food growing land into factories for export production. Funded largely by Japan, it is the kind of so-called reform demanded by the IMF. The new factories will produce new revenue and profits for foreigners. They will also produce new debt for the Philippines. Calabarzon typifies the kind of development strategy which only brings ruin to the third world because such a strategy is premised, for example, on massive development so-called development, massive exploitation of the environment, uh, change in people's way of life, uh, taking land from the uh, people and the peasants to be able to convert this into so-called industrial zones with the problems of pollution and everything. And usually, this development strategy is fueled by debt, fueled by foreign investment. The Calabazon project will destroy food-growing land on which an estimated 8 million people depend. The farmers have been given little or no notice, and compensation generally has been meagre. In the meantime, many of them will end up on the streets of Manila, homeless. Japanese, American, and other foreign-owned factories will rise on the paddies and fields. By the year 2000, hardly a tree will be left standing Forests as big as Denmark have been wiped out, bringing to an end one of the richest ecosystems on the planet, the home of thousands of species of plants and animals. The environment is probably the major victim next to human beings of the debt crisis, if only because countries are obliged to cash in their resources. They must cut down their forests. They must dig up their minerals and ruin their land, producing cash crops so that they can earn enough hard currency to keep on paying the debt. There is an almost perfect correlation between the top debtors and the top deforesters. It's a striking correlation. In the Amazon area of Brazil, in Ghana, in Costa Rica, roads are built, incentives are given to allow the extraction of these resources. Particularly now with structural adjustment, there is a program in place in most countries of deregulation, that is deregulating control of these industries. 
and also um, there is not enough money to over in the budget to oversee these activities. So you're seeing the wholesale raping of these environments. At their 1991 conference, the World Bank and IMF appeared to be making a special commitment to the environment. What would your response be to that? If the World Bank is now saying how green it is, what it's not saying is how much it has destroyed through its policies. It's not enough to put a green tail on a very large, monstrous dog, which is destroying the environment, and that is what debt is doing. Welcome to the World Bank and International Monetary Fund conference in Bangkok. The aim of the conference is, and I quote, to find ways of eradicating poverty all over the world. Alas, there are contradictions. You see, most of the delegates are bankers. Now, this is not to suggest that bankers don't care about poor people. It's just that some things are hard to explain, such as why officials of the World Bank spend, in their pursuit of solutions for the poor, an estimated $45 million a year flying first class and staying in five-star hotels. And why at this conference, chefs have been flown in, especially from Paris, to a country where children still die from malnutrition, and why they need to be shadowed by more doctors than most people in Southeast Asia see in a lifetime. In fact, the United States was able to tailor the UN Security Council to its war plans by using debt in the international banks. Egypt was told that if it joined the coalition, $14 billion would be wiped off its national debt. And Iran, reported Reuter, was rewarded for its support of the United States with its first loan from the World Bank since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. The day before the ground attack, the bank approved a loan to Iran of $250 million. And China received the first World Bank loan since the Tiananmen Square massacre just one week after the Chinese foreign minister met President Bush at the White House. Outside the bank, Syria was promised a billion dollar arms deal brokered by Washington, and a photo opportunity was arranged with President Bush. An international terrorist was suddenly an old friend. The vote of the non-permanent members of the Security Council was critical. Minutes after Yemen voted against the resolution to go to war, a senior American diplomat was instructed to tell the Yemeni ambassador that was the most expensive no vote you ever cast, meaning that $70 million in American aid to one of the poorest countries in the world would be stopped. The use of debt in bribing the coalition was nothing new. Manipulation of the World Bank was documented in the early 1980s in a secret US Treasury report. The United States, says the report, is capable and willing to pursue important policy objectives in the banks by exercising the financial and political leverage at our disposal. In other words, the US is able to impose its will on the World Bank. Britain's influence on the international banks is small compared with the United States, but British high street banks are deeply involved in third world debt. In one year, 1990, Four countries transferred more than £6 billion net to British banks. On top of this, the banks were allowed tax relief on making provision for so-called doubtful loans. From 1987 to 1990, this tax relief amounted to £1.6 billion, the equivalent of ten times what the British public gives in charitable donations to the third world. We invited all the high street banks to be interviewed about this. All of them refused. So we asked the Bankers Association to explain it, and they said it was nothing unusual. As in all business debt, they said, the tax relief would have to be paid back when the principal loan was paid back. In the meantime, the banks can keep the tax relief and still demand interest payments. And this constant demand is true also of the IMF and the World Bank. Given that most countries do have enough resources to provide for their people, why should they have to tolerate a system that forces parents to watch their children die slowly 
like the children of Eddie and Teresita in the Philippines. Indeed, why should the burden of debt fall to those least responsible for it? At the other end of the scale, why should British high street banks get tax relief of more than a billion pounds just in case loans are not paid back? That amount of money would immunize 400 million children against preventable disease. Above all, why should the lives of ordinary people be controlled by a few who are themselves unaccountable and whose decisions and judgments are dictated by a belief that economics is meant not to serve people, but as some kind of holy writ requiring regular offerings, even blood sacrifices, to a god called the bottom line. The debt of all poor countries accounts for less than 5% of the loans of commercial banks. If the debt was cancelled unconditionally, the banks would hardly know the difference. If it's not cancelled, the scenes shown in this film will endure and people may take it no more, and perhaps the debt war will no longer be silent. Is that the kind of world we are to give those children who reach the 21st century?